Hi, it's Cara O'Reilly, and welcome to episode number 18 of the Landscape Photography Show. We're delighted to be sharing with you different professionals who are very proficient at what they do. And tonight on the Landscape Photography Show, we are going to have a very special guest who we'll introduce in a while here, Ray Billcliffe uh, from uh, the UK. And um, so we'll get back to him. Let's let we'll see who else is on our panel. Uh, I am, like I said, Cara Riley with uh, Photo Tour Global Directory, and I'm a curator on the landscape photography uh, theme page, and also several other themes. And we'll go right to Margaret, who was the originator of the landscape photography theme. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Margaret Thompson. Are you there Margaret? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me okay? I'm uh, in Kansas City, Missouri yes. and um, a retired uh, an amateur photographer and I just love landscape photography and I love Ray Billcliffe's work. I am so thrilled is, tonight. Uh, um, is everybody hearing her or just me having troubles here? I hear her just fine. Okay, every Everyone can hear me except Cara. So I just want to uh, say hello to everyone. I uh, hope you'll join us uh, in the landscape photography theme. And uh, I'll turn this back over to Cara. Great. Thank you, Margaret. And we'll jump right over here to Utah with uh, Kevin Rowe. Kevin? Yeah, thank you. Uh, Kevin Rowe, and I live in South Jordan, Utah, which is in the Salt Lake City Valley. Um, I have a, a full-time job as a mortgage lender, and my my passion and my hobby, I guess, is photography. And you can find me at my website, which is uh, kevinrowphoto.com. Um, I'm a curator for the landscape photography theme. And also, if you visit or you live in Utah and you get pictures of uh, photos from Utah, then come join my community, which is the Utah Photographers Community. We'd love to see your photos there and give people ideas of places to shoot around here. So thanks, Cara. Yes, wonderful. And then we'll just jump over to where we've got some monsoons going, Jim Worthman. Yeah, we sure do. I'm Jim Worthman. And uh, I'd like to welcome all the viewers and also our gremlins tonight. They're with us, as usual. Um, I'm kind of an amateur enthusiast photographer. I have a, a different job during the day, um, but I really enjoy landscape photography whenever I get a chance. Um, I, I like both color and black and white, so you'll see that kind of work in my stream. I'm based in Phoenix, Arizona, so I have lots of great landscape opportunities in just a couple hours drive from here. Um, I also assist uh, Margaret with curating in the landscape photography theme as well as working in the landscape photography community. So Kara, back to you. Great. Well. Thank you, distinguished panels here, <laughs> and I'm going to have so much fun. I'm going to uh, feature uh, Ray as I introduce him here. I'm going to put the blue box around you, Ray, so everybody can just look and, and see what a fun guy you are. Now, you told me you were going to have that yellow raincoat, and I do not see it. <laughs> but if you have uh, been on any of Ray's themes, Ray is an amazing curator. He has a theme for every single day. Um, and he started, well, I'm going to tell a little bit, and then he'll be able to tell you his story, as an underwater scuba diver in the year 2000 and has evolved into just an amazing photographer. He has uh, Dawn on Sunday. Monday, Lily Monday, Grass Tuesday, Waterbird Wednesday, Leaves on Thursday, Buggy Friday, Swampy Saturday, Paintography, The Magic of Light, and True Portraits. And uh, Ray is, uh, you're going to love his um, accent because uh, he's right on the northern border uh, of the UK, up there uh, close to Scotland. So Ray, welcome to our show and we're so excited to listen to you and what you think while you're shooting and composing a composition. 
Okay, can everybody see me? Yeah. Yes. Okay, don't don't do anything with your screens, with your cameras. I am purple. That's to do with my overhead light because it's three o'clock in the morning here. If I turn the overhead lights off, you won't see me at all because it goes dark. Um, I'm thrilled to be here on the show. Um, I did a, a little test hangout a few days ago, so this will only my second time of doing this. So if things go wrong, I want you to blame Cara and not me. <laughs> it's the group. Okay, I, I absolutely enjoy Google Plus and the uh, curating the themes. Um, and photography is my passion. I'm absolutely thrilled that there's so many people around the world who take an interest in my photography and join in with my themes. If you post a picture and I haven't got around to commenting on it, please forgive me because I try my best, um, but I don't get to see them all coming through, uh, through my stream in the UK here. Actually, I get very few from the USA coming through on the UK. I don't know if you guys get mine over there. Um, <laughs> well, Ray, you know what I did? I forgot our show starter, and just before we start looking at your photos, we need to look at some and acknowledge the wonderful people who were came to the event. We have just started adding an event every time we have a show, and we're um, really encouraging people to come and participate. And uh, Kevin has up for us um, our show starters. And uh, so this is Philip Clark, who, and we'll let yeah. Yeah, I chose I chose this photo. Um, we're kind of on the theme of the magic of light a little bit with Ray, and this is kind of uh, a good example of light uh, showing you what you want to see and kind of hiding the stuff that you don't, making a natural vignette. Yeah. And then, uh, Cara, I think this is yours. Yes, and um, this is Tommy. I know he's listening. Um, he is from Singapore, and um, he, Tommy Lim KW, peace to you, and he's been on all of our uh, events, and the reason I really liked this one is the, you can see right there, I, I, you're not seeing my pointer, but there is a cargo ship in the background, and it's right there on the horizon, the light coming through, um, the clouds, it's just a, a real unique picture of the Singapore area, and Tommy, you did a great job with the light, thank you. Margaret? Uh, this is one by our very own Cara Riley under the <laughs> photos by Cara. Uh, I was really drawn to this one with the rich um, stem color in the leaves and those water drops and I think it shows sort of the uh, wonderful minute things that you can find right out you know in your backyard so you don't have to always go to Grand Vistas to create wonderful photographs and Ray's going to have some wonderful examples of that tonight but that was my pick. Uh, thank you Margaret. Jim? Yeah thanks. Um, so this is uh, from Renee Kisselbach and it uh, was taken um, near Sydney Australia um, again, the, the magic of light being the theme, I was really taken with, uh, with the light in the scene. But not only that, I love the composition with the strong foreground and also the way the arrangement of rocks in the foreground in a way kind of mirrors the arrangement of the, of the bright clouds in the sky. They, they, ha they both have kind of an arc to them that sort of points over to the left side of the image. So anyway, I thought this was a, a great shot for tonight. All right, and then Ray? Yeah, I picked this picture because it's very much the kind of picture that I like to take. I wish I had taken this one. This is a beautiful picture. Um, Last Tuesday is right there at the front, and you've got dawn on Sunday coming up over the hillside. <laughs> <coughs> and the magic of light is all over the entire picture. Magnificent shot. This one's by Tony Hayward. He took this on April the 30th, not so long back. And uh, Tony has captured everything about the landscape um, in this picture. Uh, magnificent shot. Well done, Tony. Yeah. Uh, well, 
Thank you again to all of the people who have um, put their photos, shared their photos in the event. It really does make it fun, and we hope that you enjoy our show starters um, with acknowledging you and the time that you've taken to support the event. So now we're going to go back to Ray, and Ray is going to share with us uh, some of his compositions and the thoughts behind what he thinks before taking that shot. Sorry, Cora, I'm having a problem here. Oh, that's all right. We, we, we can walk you through it. You know, these gremlins, we, we got to name the gremlins now, but um, <laughs> the screen share. Okay, there you go. You We've got your screen. Now we are seeing all of your photos. Okay, I've clicked on one picture. It shows a gentleman standing on the rocks, very bright over on the, uh, on the horizon. He's got a baby on his back. Can you see well, that? We're seeing we're seeing a whole, I, I don't know, are you guys seeing it? I'm seeing a, like 12 or 14 pictures. Yeah, just the thumbnails. Okay. It's a, it, this, this happens, and so to our viewers, uh, <laughs> we all go through this. Even when you practice, it still happens. So let's try it again there. Uh, just click the screen share and... And always, when it's uh, when it's your first time, it just happens to every single person. <laughs> okay, do you see it now? There yeah, we go. It's awesome. We see it. Beautiful. Okay. Okay. Um, photographing the light. This picture is a prime example. Um, it's got a gentleman here. He's introducing his baby to the dawn. This is uh, about an hour after the sun actually came up. A uh, very, very bright morning, no mist, uh, no clouds in the sky, no color, very bright white sun. Um, and I, I, I exposed this picture for the middle ground, that's uh, the, the rock sort of at the feet of where the gentleman is standing, and that way it gave me um, the light coming in from the sun on the top right down to the shades at the uh, front of the picture. And it allows for lots of detail, and I also ex um, did a little bit of um, exposure compensation at plus one, uh, just to bring out the light. I to point out with when you're shooting the light that it's uh, important that you get some detail in your picture, but don't be worried about the whites, uh, what they call burnout. Um, that's not really that important and it can enhance the picture. There's a lot of white areas in this picture that has no detail um, and that's excellent. Um, beautiful shot. Um, take the person away there with his baby and it would just be another picture. The, the couple of the people in there really do uh, make it what it is. So if I click to another picture, can you guys tell me if you see it? Yes. Sure. You see the lighthouse in the distance and a couple of little people walking? We do, yep. yes, perfect. <coughs> yep, that works. Okay, glad you got it. Now we got this together. Um, my EXIF data shows me that this is a two and a half second F16 uh, shot almost in the middle of the day. The sun is way out the picture up in the horizon, probably a noonday sun. Two and a half seconds was because I used an ND filter, a number four ND filter, to allow me to get more detail in the picture. Uh, without the ND filter, this would have been a, probably somewhere about one, two, two and a half thousand second uh, shot with very little detail. Um, ND filters are very important when you shoot in, in the noonday sun and any bright sort of uh, landscape. What makes this picture nice is the couple of the, that's walking on the rocks. Take those two people out, and the picture is just another seascape picture. And that's my favorite lighthouse way over there. It's about a five-minute walk from where I live. I live just off the picture to the right. Very beautiful, calm day. There's uh, no waves in the water, and the sun is reflecting and I just love being in there. This is my magic place. I'm going to change to another picture now. Can you guys see the uh, beach? Yep. Okay. 
This again is an ND photo shot, uh, very bright sunshine. This is a three second exposure. And without the ND photo, there is no way you would have got the detail in the rocks and the lighthouse in the distance would have totally vanished. Exposure here was very, very important. You can't expose for the light, if I'd expose for the white areas where the water is, the bottom half of this picture and the rocks over on the right would have been just black. If I'd expose for the darkness of the rocks at the front, then the lighthouse wouldn't be seen. So I exposed this picture for the sand, just about a uh, third of the way up in the picture over on the right hand side. That gave me a middle ground exposure. Uh, the ND filter allowed me to keep the, the shutter open for three and a half seconds or three seconds and that got me the detail in the rocks. If you follow the rock line along, you can see all those tiny little rocks that have fallen off the uh, top of the cliffs and the green on the, um, the, the seaweed. So ND filter, this is a number four. You, they come from number one all the way up to, I think, to about uh, number nine. I have, a, I have two, I have a nine and a four. Um, if you guys are going to buy an ND filter, then I suggest you buy the best one you can afford. Uh, mine are uh, Tiffin. <coughs> the middle, middle of the range price, they work very well. You can okay. combine the two together and I can get an ND filter of 14, which would give me probably a four minute exposure on this uh, particular scene. Uh, Ray, when you're talking about nine and four, you're talking, is that the number of light stops that it's reducing? Yeah, they start at number one, which gives yeah. you, uh, actually, you know, it, it, it's not the number of light stops. I think it's multiplied by four. So a number one would give you four F stops. A number two will give you eight. A uh, number four will give you a 16. It's multiplied by four. And it goes up to something like 40. Oh, my. So if you're looking through, if you don't have a live view screen and you were looking through the viewfinder, you would just see black. You wouldn't be able to focus. Um, I have a live view screen on my uh, Sony camera. <coughs> and I would never go back to using a camera without a live view screen. I like to be able to see my picture, the finished picture uh, changing as I make uh, exposure ch uh, changes, if I make shutter speed changes. The live view screen will change and show me exactly what I'm going to get, or oh, nearly exactly. It's never quite exactly the same. So there's a, this, shot, this shot has about 16 f-stops from that bright sunshine to the, uh, the darkest area. Great, thanks. You change this. You see the picture now where this is a place called Lake Harmon. It's in the Florida Everglades where I used to live until about a year ago. Yes. Yeah, this is a dawn shot, and one of those beautiful misty dawns. There was no clouds in the sky. Temperature had cooled a little bit through the night for the Everglades. It had gone from 100 degrees down to about 90, so it was, uh, it was really a beautiful, beautiful morning. And the exposure here wasn't really difficult because the overall ambience of the picture was uh, this sort of middle gray color or as the camera sees it, middle grey, but your eyes will see it as this beautiful golden glow. Yeah. So, um, so Ray, we have a, actually we have a question from yep. Russ, Russ Gowen. He says, Ray, have you tried a variable ND filter? I, Russ, uh, no, I only have two filters. They are uh, both just solid ND filters. I've not had a variable. Um, never tried the one. Um, I try to keep my equipment as down to as small as possible. <clears throat> I have a circular polarizer which is on my camera on uh, two of my lenses uh, permanently and I use them. Um, but I've never used a variable. No, I have no idea what, what would happen if I did. Um, I, just real quick, I, I have tried a variable and I I don't use it. I have one. I don't ever use it because you can you can create um, variable instances within software so easily now that I don't feel they're worth taking around and using the hassle. So I just use the solid ones. Yeah, I should point out a little bit here as we're going through these pictures. 
Uh, the finished picture you're seeing is not the same as the original I actually took. Remember, I use Adobe Photoshop. Uh, I used a lot, a lot of software, and I make enhancements to the color and to the light, to the contrast. Um, but having said that, um, I know we're going to go into a little tutorial here about your camera. But when you get into the settings of your camera, remember you can change the sharpness, you can change contrast, you can change saturation. I have my saturation set on plus two, anything higher than that, and the reds become too red. I have my uh, contrast on plus two, and I have my sharpness on plus one. If I'm shooting a sunset or a sunrise, I will take the saturation and drop it down from plus two to plus one. So if you're playing around with the saturation, etc., on your camera, um, don't go too high. Anything above plus three will just give you a, a really mass saturated picture. But experiment with your camera. Don't just do what the camera says it does when it, it came to you in the box. Uh, it'll do a lot of good things. You just need to practice with it. Can you see my little seaweed and rock in the sea now? Yep. Yeah. Beautiful. Okay, this was done just a few days ago. This is just up the coast from where I live. I sort of cheated here a little bit. I was right down on the waterline and the tide is coming in, but I put that seaweed in front of me. Uh, to get this picture, I wanted the picture of the water coming right over. It's not quite as sharp as I wanted it on the right hand side. The, the little foamy bits have lots of bubbles into it. Um, so I didn't get this quite as sharp as I'd like, but the, the dawn was nice. The ambient light was pretty good. And um, you see that big rock that's in the water there sticking up. Uh, all of that area to about a football field, the other side, the far distance behind that rock, is all rocks when the tide goes out. This is almost a high tide. Um, I had to keep lifting my camera. It's uh, six inches off the ground here with the tripod legs sprayed out. And I had to keep lifting it up to uh, let the water pass underneath. You've got to be very careful. You don't want a wave going over your camera because that's the end of your photography for the day. Yep. And probably for the rest of the month until you get it repaired. <laughs> so are you down on your knees or on your tummy? Really? I'm on my knees here. Uh, I'm sort of one knee because I need to keep standing up, otherwise that water is going to go all over me. Um, <laughs> I have uh, rubber boots on, um, so the, my shoes and socks don't get soaking wet. When that wave passes under me, this one's not so bad that I photographed. It's actually stopping just there. But... Um, some of the ones before that and uh, after that one was were, were sweeping right underneath me, uh, probably to a depth of about six or seven inches. Um, but yes, I would not, I would lie down on a scene like this if I knew I wasn't going to get uh, soaking wet and risk my camera. I would be lying down. But my camera is wet. You know, I've got the legs sprayed right out, so the camera is probably about six inches uh, above the ground here. Mm. And. Um, so do you use a remote then to um, actually take the picture also? Yes, I'm using a remote shutter. Um, the shutter speed on this is about one quarter of a second at F22 and ISO 100. And I'm using a remote shutter release. If I don't use my remote shutter, I have, uh, have this set on to the uh, self-portrait mode, the little clock at two seconds. Um, which which uh, will take a good picture, but you can't get the timing right. When he'll go d d d d d for two seconds, then takes the picture, and by then the wave has come and gone. So a remote shutter is very important, and always, always, always use a tripod. And I'll see a lot of photographers out there when I'm shooting, and they aren't holding their pictures in the dawn, and I don't believe that they're getting good shots at all. You really do need a tripod. It's a pain, but Tripod does a very good thing as well. It actually slows you down, lets you think about what you're doing. Hmm. You see my big oh, red rock is. now? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this was a picture I took uh, probably about six weeks ago, five or six weeks ago. Uh, you see, it's a dawn shot. All my pictures are shot in the dawn or the sunset. I do very little through the day. Sun is uh, just about 
30 minutes over the horizon and it's lighting up this beach uh, magic. I don't know how many dawn shooters uh, we have out there that's watching the show, but this is the time of day when you will get some fantastic shots. But not all the dawns are the same. They're not all as beautiful as this. But if I you're have not it. there for the bad ones, you're not going to see the good ones. Ray, I have it on good authority that uh, Kevin has never seen a sunrise. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, he's not the only one. Like Kevin, you're not the only one. <laughs> a lot of people have never seen a sunrise, but I see the same two photographers when I'm out here shooting the lighthouse and they don't. They're there all the time. And then there's four or five will show up through the day. Uh, but there's only two more that actually get the dawn. But you can't get this picture any other time of the day. It's just not possible. Well, this so isn't really good. I've got. I've got at least three that are willing to get up early on here. I'm first time I've ever been outnumbered on the early risers here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, get it, get it. if you can get up for a shot like this, uh, my son's going to rise this morning at 6.30. Um, a month or so ago, it came up at 4.30. Um, but even 6.30, if you go out and you shoot this for 30 minutes, so then it gets you to 7 o'clock. You've still got time to go home, have a breakfast, and get ready to go to work. And this will set you up for the day. When you know you've got a shot like this in the bag, it's going to make you happy the rest of the day. <clears throat> this is, uh, I'm even impressed with that. I look at this picture and think, wow, Ray, did you take that? This is magnificent. <laughs> you know, I'm sure Trey Ratcliffe took this picture. I, do, I, I love the, the wet sand and how it reflects the light. And you see yeah, just a yeah. bit of reflection on that lighthouse there and the wet sand. I mean, th this is just incredible. Amazing. I know Margaret and I either shared, I can't remember which one, we shared this on the theme page. I think we so. both did. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> yeah, I put, I, put this, I put this picture onto the plus photo extract to, to see if they'll put it in their magazine. And it got quite a number of nominations, so we'll we'll wait and see to see if uh, Jarek puts this in his uh, his magazine. There. Well, we have another question from Russ. Um, yep. What would you recommend for a tripod and a tripod head? Uh -huh, that's a good question, Russ. It's got to be what you can afford, but don't whatever you do, don't buy cheap. If you're buying a um, a tripod, if it's going to cost you under a hundred pounds, which uh, 150, 160 US dollars, it's going to be too cheap and it's not going to last you. You need a good solid, uh, Manfrotto do a whole range of really good ones. Uh, my tri tripod is a Manfrotto, um, I believe it costs somewhere in the region of $400 uh, a couple of years ago. Before that I had a fairly cheap one, which was a pain. Uh, the Manfrotto is absolutely fantastic. Uh, my ball head is a Vanguard. Uh, it's a middle of the range price. Everything I try to get is a middle of the range. I'm not rich, so I can't afford the top of the range uh, stuff. The middle range is very good. Manfrotto, uh, there are a lot out there, so Google around and uh, find out recommendations. Always read reviews if you're shopping on Amazon. See what people say about the um, about the tripod and the head. But mine's a Vanguard head, quick release, uh, easily moves it around, and you can adjust the tension to get it to just where you want it. Tripods are very important, guys. Um, get the best you can afford. <clears throat> I totally agree with that as well. Yeah. I bought a cheap uh, is, uh, it was a waste of money. Yeah. Yeah, it's important to get a really good one. Okay, we have a shot of a, a river here. Uh, I call this the Minty River because it's crystal clear. Mm. This is in the Lake District of uh, England, a place called Cumbria. Uh, the sun is about 30 minutes to an hour above the horizon. This is a early spring time. The, the greens and the yellows are the fresh leaves. This is not a fall shot. Um, the leaves are all sort of brand new. This tree right at the front hasn't got any of its leaves grown on it yet, or very few. So I picked the location because the, 
the branches at the uh, the foreground tree wouldn't block out the uh, the horizon and the sun coming up. Um, this beautiful expanse at the bottom right, where the the reflection of the trees is shown into, and um, this is a middle color ex uh, exposure. Always try to expose um, for the middle ground of your picture, and then if you want to emphasize the light, you can go plus one ex uh, exposure compensation, or if you want to get to the darks, then you can go minus one. But it, it's just play around with it, or better still, bracket the three shots, two steps apart, and then you get best, you get best of uh, three words. You get the good one, two stops under, two stops over. And you can put the three together into uh, software like Photomatix Pro and come up with one beautiful picture. I didn't do this with this picture, but it's a good way to do HDR pictures. Colors are uh, very important. Um, again, my camera is set to plus two saturation, uh, just to bring out more deeper color. And I just emphasize, I do shoot raw. Um, that way you get uh, all the information into the picture. You can shoot JPEG if you wish, but I would uh, highly recommend you don't. Uh, set your camera to raw and shoot everything raw, and you will get much more detail and colors in your picture. You just got to learn a little bit on how to bring them out with the uh, Adobe Camera Raw, etc. But the colors are there, and you just got to bring them out where you want them. This is uh, the same place as the picture before. This is Combrae, same day, same morning. That misty uh, light is in the valley there. All I did was turn myself around, and this is shooting away from the river, almost opposite direction. Um, always turn around when you're shooting the dawn and the sunset because you never know what's going on behind you. Keep looking around. Um, be patient. You've got to stop and think about what it is you're doing and what it is you want to do. Uh, I composed this picture fairly good. I moved a little, uh, little bit uh, the tripod to get that tree um, to block out that V-shape in the valley to give some balance to the picture. And we have all those beautiful colors of the sun just catching the tree trunk. And then you've got the darker shades. Um, I don't know what I can say. Uh, plus two saturation. Uh, and be patient. Always think about what you're doing when you take a shot like this. What is it you're trying to get? Had I gone a little bit to this, this is a minus one uh, an exposure compensation because I wanted that light in the valley. A little misty uh, band that goes through. I wanted that to stand up. And... Uh, this is not a one-off shot, the other way, guys. Uh, you listen to this. I don't just click and then get this one picture. I probably took 20 pictures of that scene and changed some of the settings on the camera as well as I was doing them, just to try to get the big one. Move my tripod two feet to the left, two feet to the right, and to keep taking different shots. Don't just settle for one picture, because if you get home and it's not a good one, you'll be kicking yourself. Um, this is not quite on my doorstep. It's 150 miles from where I live, so mm. I have to drive there um, and drive back again. It's not something I can do every day. Take lots and lots of shots. Fill up your cards. Have lots of memory cards. Um, I use a Sony, so I have Sony Pro Duo, and they are 32 gigs, and I can get a thousand dollars at uh, raw on each one of those cards. I think it's actually about 1,200. So, and I fill them. I take hundreds and hundreds of shots. And when I get to them, I will delete 90% of them. 95 will all be just gone. But who knows? One of them might be really, really good. And if you only took one and it's a bad one, you'll be sorry. Okay, here we are back onto my doorstep. This is a one-minute walk from where I live. Wow. Uh, again, it's dawn. And the importance here is the uh, the timing of the picture. Take those splashes of waves away. These are not really big waves, but they're hitting the little rock there and, and bouncing up. Take those splashes out, and this is just another picture. The splashes actually make it, so the timing was very, very important. Uh, rule of thirds, uh, always when you do a landscape shots, uh, very important. 
Get your horizon straight. Make sure it's level. You can do that afterwards in Photoshop if you didn't do it at the time. And um, put your eyes in bottom third or the top third. See my leading lines on this picture is the line of foam. It starts on the right hand side. It makes its way up and it catches the light and leads you into where the waves are uh, breaking. Got a lot of contrast in light here the, between the very dark water and the darker sky and the white water that's yeah. uh, where the foam and the froth is. Again, exposed for middle ground. Um, your camera doesn't see light the way your eyes see it. If you were looking at a person standing with the sun right behind them, your eyes will be able to pick out all the fine detail and adjust for the different lights and, and different shades. Well, your camera can't do that. Uh, probably will one day. I'm sure Sony will figure it out. And, but right now it doesn't. So your camera only slides to see everything as middle gray and then black or white on either side of that. We have two questions here, um, Ray. One yeah. from, from Chris Whiting. Does the camera settings on saturation and such make it to the raw file or only the JPEG preview? Uh, good question, Chris. <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, I'm, I'm, not real, I'm not a technical photographer, so I just know when I shoot raw, the colors and the light that I want are there in the file. It's just up to me now to be able to play around with the camera roll and bring them out. This picture of the sea here, the contrasts here are almost beyond what the camera can pick. And I'm almost sure if this was a JPEG, it wouldn't look like it does now. Ray? Uh, Kevin or Jim, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, um, I, first I agree with, with Ray, definitely shoot raw um, because it captures so much more data. But as far as the saturation and contrast settings, at it, that may vary by manufacturer, but at least for Canon and I'm pretty sure Nikon, those affect the JPEG and not the raw file. The raw file really is captured straight off the sensor in most cases. So, but what it does do is if you've, if you've tweaked those up to your liking, then the preview you're seeing on the LCD on the back of your camera is more representative of what you're going to get after you tweak the raw file in post-processing. So, yeah, let, me, let me add to that real quick because I shoot Sony as well, Ray. So on the Sony, no, that does not but go over to the raw file. But just like Jim was saying, um, everything is live view on my Sony Annie X. So if you would make those adjustments, then you're going to see on your live view a different, a different scene. So you're going to get a better idea of what your end file might look like through the live view. Okay. Thanks. And there's another question. Um, this is from Tony Hayward, one of our uh, show starters. Ray, I notice most of your images have a huge dynamic range. Do you rely on single exposures or do you bracket for later blending? Yeah, Tony, I do both of those things. Um, a shot like this you see on the screen now with the, with the water in motion, uh, you can't do bracketing shots on that because the, the waves move on all the time. So this is a single exposure. The landscape I shot that I showed earlier with the leaves and the trees, if I know they're not going to be moving around, I will bracket the shots. I do, uh, my camera will set for three exposures, uh, two, two stops in between each one. Um, and then I put them together in Photomatics Pro and then play with the, uh, the adjustments, etc. But a seascape shot like this, Tony, is just a single exposure. And then I try to do post-processing to get as much darks and lights as I can and, and keep the, uh, the overall color. And then we have um, Philip Clark, another one of our show starters. The first thing he said was that dawn and dusk are the only times I shoot color midday, great for black and white. But then now he has a question. Um, how much time do you take to let the scene speak to you? 
do you observe it for a while or even um, a while before even taking out the camera? It's kind of an Ansel Adams question, right? <laughs> It's a great question, and uh, if you've ever been on my website at True Portraits, I have some tutorials there. But on the tutorial introduction page, I have in almost in capital letters: stop, think, shoot. You have to stop and ask yourself, what is it about what I've just seen that made me stop? What am I looking at? And then you, you need to put your fingers up in front of you and make that little square and move it around to see where the picture can be framed. Um, this shot with the, the waves breaking up, if I'd move 10 feet to my left or 10 feet to my right, it wouldn't be the same. Uh, I wouldn't have the leading line. I wouldn't have the light where I wanted it. Yeah, you've got to stop and you've got to think very carefully what is it you're trying to achieve with a shot and then go from there. Okay, yeah, that's dawn on Sunday. We just got through there. Lots of dawn pictures. We're going to move on to Lily Monday. And uh, Ray, we've <coughs> got about 15 minutes remaining. Okay, I'm going to go through fairly quickly. Then here we have a close-up shot of the lily. What makes the picture here very nice is that little bee that sort of tangled in um, the little stamens inside the lily there. Um, very narrow depth of field. I'm shooting this at f2.8, so we'll blur out the background and put the emphasis right where I want it. Again, plus two saturation um, for the colors. This is a fairly important shot to, to look at. When a lot of people walk into a lily pond, they see the lily, beautiful reds and yellows and white lily flowers. Some people will see the lily pads, which are green. Some people will even see the dragonfly sitting on the leaf, very few, but only about one person out of every hundred that walks in will see the dragonfly shadow. And just to answer that question that I was just asked before, stop, think, and shoot, it is the shadow that makes this picture. It's not the dragonfly, and it's not the leaf, it's not the overall ambience, it is the shadow. Uh, very important to make sure what it is you're looking at, whether you look at a picture. I uh, posted this on G Plus yesterday. This is uh, when it gets too bright for me to be shooting out uh, in the open. I try to move into the trees in the forest, and this is a great grass Tuesday shot because you've got all kinds of grasses in here. You could set your tripod up here with a macro lens or... Um, uh, and a 1650 millimeter lens and you could spend all day shooting in that tiny little area. There is so much there to see. When you get into the little bit and you start looking at each individual leaf, you'll find bugs and spiders and flies. And you can spend a lifetime in that little area uh, shooting away in there. Colors coming down as the, the light coming down through the trees catches those little spots yeah. and lights up the, the ground. And that's the emphasis in the picture, is catching the light. Just magical. Um, yeah. It's a magical scene. Any little girl will tell you that's where fairies live. <laughs> I, I was going to say, I can see the fairies. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you can. Um, I couldn't see any. I'm, not, I'm an old man now, so I don't see fairies anymore. But I know where they live. <laughs> that I do. Um, this is a close-up shot of a, a similar scene. This is a meadow, and I'm shooting away from the sun. The sun is behind me, or just a little bit off to my right-hand side. I'm shooting F, I believe it's F3.5 uh, for this picture. And when I, when I got down on my stomach, and I'm about two inches off the ground here, uh, what caught my eye was the whites, those little blashes of white that's coming off this grass. I'm not sure what you call that stuff, but these little bit hairy bits that stick out. The light was catching these and making them almost pure white. And I used the uh, sponge tool in Adobe Photoshop. That's my favorite tool. The sponge tool is 30% saturation just to bring out those oranges a little bit. Uh, moving back away from the sea a little bit, uh, this was the shot the other day when I got the same red rock. We had that beautiful golden glow. 
and this is moving up onto the uh, cliff top about 30 feet above the beach and shooting straight out over the ocean. Those little flowers on the right hand side, they're clover, they're sort of a goldy orange color and the light of the, the grass just the other side is that beautiful golden glow coming from the dawn. Um, great grass Tuesday shot, it's got everything into it, it's got saturation, it's got light, it's got shapes, it's got darks and lights. Uh, I love shooting the grass, I really do. I had a gentleman the other day with a, uh, he carries his cell phone around in his hand, he never ever puts it down, I asked him, he was always bragging about how it's an 8 megapixel camera and he doesn't take a lot of pictures because he can't find anything to photograph, that's what he told me. Uh, there's always something out there to shoot. I shoot, if it's raining, I will shoot rain dogs. <coughs> Down in the grass again, um, everybody knows what dandelions are, you blow them and they blow away and you make wishes and uh, very difficult thing to photograph. These things are so delicate and fragile, if you breathe too much they will disappear on you. Uh, focus is very, very important here and I focused on the one that's just fallen to pieces just off center, as the, what caught my eye was the little orange bits of the seed pot on the end of the little, I don't know what you call those things. Uh, anyway, it's the little orangey seed pot bits there that look really nice. Gorgeous grass Tuesday shot. I, I love shooting the grass. Water bird Wednesday. How close can you get to your bird? <laughs> This is a great shot. The, the, this, this gentleman here is a, he's from Germany. This is in the Everglades. It's a place called Estero Lagoon. This is salt water, so he can sit there and he's not going to get attacked by alligators. You wouldn't do this to the Everglades in fresh water. Yeah, that would be risky. <laughs> but this is a salt water lagoon. That's a 400 millimeter uh, lens he's got on there with the big, the big flash. Uh, and he can't take a picture because the bird got too close. For anybody who's ever shot egrets and herons in the Everglades, you will know you cannot get close to these birds. That bird walked to him because he was sitting down. He doesn't look like a person. He looks like a rock in the water. As long as he doesn't make any silly moves, uh, moves too fast, that bird is just going to keep walking right up. And the bird did. It, it just stood there and looked at him. And he's saying, hey, back off, buddy. I need to take a picture. You're too close. And I learned a lot by that. Uh, next day I was sitting down in the water and I was getting magnificent shots. The birds were coming right up to me and they weren't afraid. So don't look like a human. <laughs> That's Beautiful a dawn shot in the other um, This is in the dry season. This area where I am at the front here is, uh, is caked mud. Um, I'm sinking in a little bit, a couple of inches here, uh, my, my boots are all muddy. Um, this is right after the sun has just broken the horizon, lots of egrets and uh, birds are in the, the water and they gather in areas like this because this is where the fish are, this is where the food and as the water shrinks uh, more and more birds will come in because that's the only place they can feed. Um, I'm hiding behind this grass, uh, a little hummock here. Um, this is a wide angle lens, so I'm actually not that far away. Those birds are probably about 20 to 30 feet away from me. Uh, so I'm down low, pretending I'm not there at all, or trying to look like a uh, clump of grass. Um, wide angle lens, very important to get rule of thirds uh, correct on a picture like this. and. Every picture you do, you should be thinking one, two, three, or A, B, C, or foreground, middle ground, and background. You need three things, a focal point, a mid ground, and something way off in the distance. Uh, an opposite picture to the last one, this is a little blue egret. It's uh, not, uh, not normally this color. This is an immature blue egret. In about three or four weeks after I took this picture, this bird will go midnight blue, really dark, and you see little patches in its feathers of um, the blue starting to come through. Uh, this bird is sitting on a fence post or on a rail, probably about 15 feet, 20 feet away from me. I'm shooting this with a 300 millimeter. 
uh, paying a lot of focus attention. The, it, I'm shooting it at, four, at f4, so I can blur the background away, but try to get the details in the feathers. There's a lot of shades and lights of white in this, so exposure is very, very important. And I recommend you take multiple shots. Uh, you can't bracket these shots because the bird is going to be moving around too much. Yeah. But you can change the exposure yourself and take multiple shots. And when you get home, pick out the, the best one. This Patience. shot is gorgeous. Absolutely yeah, gorgeous. You, you have to be so patient with a shot like this because the bird doesn't do that. Lift its wing up and pose and say, hey, look at me with my wing up, take me picture. I'll stay here till you get it all right. You've just got to be there. <laughs> you've got to be ready. Um, and you've got to pay attention, and you've got, you've got to be patient. I think I stood and watched this bird for about two hours before it lifted its wing up. Uh, took maybe three, four, five hundred shots, and they're all, the bird just sitting there, and all boring, and then all of a sudden, whoops, up comes his wing, up goes his head, click, and I got a shot at the take home, and I don't care if the rest of the shots I took all day are rubbish. I got one good one, and that's what's uh, important. Patience, guys. Uh, one, one last question here from Russ, uh, Ray, um, and this is an excellent question. Ray, what is your favorite lens to use? Ah, Russ, that's, uh, you know, you are here, pro photographers tell you because they want to be smart, the best lens is the one you've got with you. Uh, and, you know, to a fact, that's true. Um, when, I'm, when I go out in the dawn, if I'm not going out to specifically shoot I have an 18, a Sigma 18-250. It's a lightweight lens. It's not the best lens on the planet, but it does a good job. And then I can do 18 millimeters for wide angle, and I can narrow it down to 250 uh, and, and pull some of the distance in. It's an easy to carry around lens if you don't want to be hunting or everything around with you. And I use that quite often. But my favorite is my 16 50 F2.8, it's a Sony lens, very expensive, uh, and it, that is my favorite lens. Uh, my other favorite lens, because I have lots of favorite lenses, my other favorite lens is my uh, my Sigma 1020. Uh, all my landscape shots are taken with that lens, and I like that because it allows me to focus up to 10 inches away from me and still get the whole mountains in the background and everything in the picture. Um, that, is a, that is an amazing deal for that lens as well. That's one of the, I think, one of the best landscape lenses out there for the price. Yeah, the 1020 is a magic lens. It really is. Uh, it, it, it doesn't distort too much on the edges. You know, you can straighten that stuff out in Photoshop afterwards. Okay, this is a great white egret, probably the most beautiful of birds. When the sun catches this bird with its wing out, you have got a picture to be proud of. This is, this is whiter than white. This is the most magnificent bird. It stands about four feet high, has a six-foot wingspan when it spreads about. And I stood here for about three hours telling this bird, put your wings out, put your wings out. <laughs> And when it did, its beak was turned up and it plucked at the feathers and I caught it just at the last moment before it decided to fold itself back up and become another egret. And I got its head coming down and a split second after I took this picture, its wing came down as well. And that was the only time it did it in that three hours that I was standing there waiting. But man, did the patience paid off. I mean, look at this. This is a beautiful picture. If anybody took this, I would say, wow. Yeah. But it didn't happen because it's just my picture. That's I'm gorgeous, right? Pleased and I'm pleased I had the patience to wait for that. And we have about five minutes remaining. Okay. This is a, the same bird, the one on the white one and the blue one. These are both little blue herons. The immature is the white one. You can see the patches of blue. And the mature bird is the, the dark blue one there. Uh, this is a great Grass Tuesday shot as well. It also goes in for the themes about reflections, uh, Water Bird Wednesday theme, uh, the, the reflections of the reeds in the water. Everglades have magnificent reeds. They call it sawgrass, and it, it's all kinds of colors. It goes from green to bright red, 
uh, as the seasons pass through the year. This is a beautiful shot of a red egret. This took weeks. This, this bird was visited this spot and I went day after day after day hoping to get a shot just like this. I must have took 5,000 pictures of this bird. Uh, have you ever seen a red egret when it's fishing, when it's, uh, it's hunting for food? It's not like the herons and the other egrets that stand still and, have, and wait for the fish to come by. This thing dances around and creates havoc. Uh, there's a magnificent bird to be watching. This is, a, this is a shot in a lifetime, a beautiful dawn golden light. The egret's got its uh, wings stuck out, its head came underneath, the, the focus is right. I will never be able to repeat this shot. I don't think I will ever be able to do this. It's a, it's a once in a lifetime shot. But you've got to be there. If you're not there, you're not going to see it. Okay, I leave on Thursday. I'm going to nip through these to get through in the last couple of minutes. <clears throat> the light shining down through the trees will light up little areas on the ground, and that's where you need to be focusing your shot. These are blackberry leaves. Everything around here is in almost darkness, and the light is catching. And beautiful shot. Shooting into the, the, the rising sun. These are potato leaves, and I love this because of the texture in those heart shapes. Um, but what actually makes this picture really nice is the is the bouquet in the background as the leaves the sun is coming through the rest of the leaves back there and uh, creates a beautiful overall image. That's gorgeous. Another thing you can do when shooting leaves is uh, wait until you get a, 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 a landscape shot out of the leaf. I had to wait for a long time for somebody to walk over that bridge and I was lucky that these two old people Arm and arm, virtually walked over the bridge, and they make the shot. It takes the people out, it's just another bridge and another leaf. Those two little people up there really made that shot. Buggy Friday. Shooting in the dawn is the best time for bugs. Sometimes you will catch them with dew drops. This one, this fly hasn't. I think this is just a common garden house fly, uh, or whatever. Uh, shooting almost directly into the sun. This is my 100 millimeter macro. It's a prime lens, uh, which means if I want to zoom in, I have to physically move the camera and tripod closer or back off. I'm probably about 18 inches away from this fly. Um, uh, F, uh, exit data shows me that 5.6. Uh, F2.8 with this 100 millimeter uh, lens, the depth of field is less than a sixteenth of an inch. Hmm. So at F2.8, the leg at the front would be in focus, but the leg on the far side wouldn't. Yeah. It would be blurry. And as you see at F5.6, that leg in the middle of the fly at the back is out of focus. So you're looking at less than an eighth of an inch, the depth of the fly. Uh, very critical on depth of field. F22, yeah, you can, but then you, you, you should the speeds go down and your, your ISO has to go up and the noise creeps in. And so it's a balance in getting what's right. Trial and, trial and error. Uh, Love of grasshoppers, this is uh, another great buggy Friday shot. This creature is about four inches long, so it's not a tiny shot. And I waited patiently to see if he would spot me, and when he did, uh, he's looking at me as if to say, well, stay there much longer and I'm going to jump on you. <laughs> uh, but he didn't. They just crawl around on the branches. Um, the light here is, uh, is great. It, it, it's uh, some time after the dawn and the light is reflected in the background. That's water that it's actually bouncing off and that gives me that beautiful background bouquet. F5.6 is most of my buggy shots are. It gives the, the blurred effect in the background. Okay, Grass Tuesday, Dawn on Sunday, Buggy Friday, um, all the themes are in this shot. Beautiful grass, this is an ornamental grass which has grown wild uh, down beside my lighthouse here, this one little area. And I actually put that snail on there guys, I have to tell you, I picked him up and I put him on there, he was about three inches away. Uh, um, you know, if you wait for a snail to crawl three inches, you're going to be there for a week. Uh, 
But anyway, I picked him up and I put him on there. And uh, of course, he went back into his shell and I had to sit for about 20 minutes to, before he came out. Um, F4, got that beautiful blurred background that is just more grass standing up in the background and shooting almost into the dawn sun. Beautiful shot. But yeah, you can move things around. I mean, some photographers say in nature you shouldn't do that. If you're not doing any damage, that's fine. Look at, for the little things in the grass when the sun gets too bright. Come in closer. This is a three-inch square on the grass. These are tiny little flowers. The little damsel fly there is about three-quarters of an inch long. And I'm focused in tight. Um, there's a whole world going on down there. Do you know that 80% of spiders in the Everglades are too small to see with the naked eye? Mm. And there's over 10,000 per square meter. Think about when you're crawling in the grass. They must be all over you. A uh, little fly on the grass. Uh, you guys seen this little brown fly? Yep. See him. Okay. Um, this is, I am I am down as low as my camera can get. My camera is pushed down on the ground, and I'm trying to shoot this fly point upwards into the sun. There's grass all around my camera, and I have to move it a couple of inches each way to, to get some of the blurred grass out of the way. And this is shooting upwards on a fly, which is on a blade of grass about three inches above the ground. Uh, very difficult to get focus up there, even with the live view screen, but I managed to do this. Um, goes well with the magic of light, because what's making that picture is not the bug, it's the light coming through the grass. Uh, the overall ambience of the light is what makes the picture. The fly is just happens to be there. Uh, swampy Saturday, dawn on Sunday, uh, tree Tuesday, all in this picture. This is the dawn light that you don't often see. This is in the Florida Everglades. I'm wading through the water here to get to this one. This is a magnificent old cypress tree. Uh, and th the bark has sort of fallen off it at this time of the year. And you've got the moss, uh, sphagnum moss hanging down. Yeah. Typical swampy scene. Um, and the dawn light coming through the, through the trees. But if you're not there, the dawn guys, and it, uh, you won't get a picture like that. Dawn or sunset is the time to be out with your camera looking for these shots. Uh, this is an English swamp. This is not too far from where I live. I can walk here in about 10 minutes. Um, again, the, the light is shining through the trees, creating these little lighted patches and the branches and the dead uh, trees in the water. Uh, you've got the different kinds of grass. Uh, the overall picture is beautiful. The, the, you've got the flowing lines of the tree coming through it. Uh, a great English swampy scene. And my paintography theme. This is what I do all the time. Uh, there's paintography in every picture you've just seen. Sometimes it's very subtle, and sometimes it's a little bit more uh, in this picture of the flower. I love paintography. I like to play around with my pictures. Uh, I'm artistic. And I think, why do I take good pictures? It's because I'm an artist. Not that I'm an artist with a camera. I'm not a great photographer. I'm an artist in this, the, the landscapes and things that I see. Um, I've never really tried painting, but if I did paint, I would probably be good. I was good at drawing at school. I'm glad that you're sticking with photography. These are just <laughs> marvelous, right? Yeah, this is uh, CS6. They have this uh, paintography uh, theme that comes under the filter menu uh, called oil paint. Uh, and it could put lots of these swirls around, or you can make those swirls go away to where this is very, very delicately painted. Some pictures go with great swirls. This one does because this, the shell is a swirl. So the swirls in the background go well with this picture. This is a snail, um, like the one that I picked up and put on the grass. This one is on the sand, and he's got little bits of sand all over him. A uh, different kind of paintography. I went to uh, the texture menu in uh, Photoshop and got the canvas sandstone effect and did multiple. So I tried to bring the leaves of these trees to look 
like 3D. That's what I was trying to get with this picture. Gorgeous reflection. Yeah. Um, this was in the, the Lake District when I was there a little while. Paintography does uh, does wonders uh, on the oil paint or pixel bender on feathers and fur. This is not too far from where I live. This is a captured stag that was injured and it was brought here and it, it can't run very well and it goes around in the field and hundreds of people turn up to take its picture so I'm just one of many people who are there. Um, and again, magic of light is right here. The sun is bouncing off the water in the background. And uh, I exposed for the darker area of the, uh, the deer here, so I would get all its first standing on. Um, yeah, not a bad picture. My true portraits, this is a friend of mine. That, uh, uh, her name's Chelsea. And she posed for me quite a lot when I was starting off in photography. Chelsea is a scuba diving instructor, and she was part of the team that worked on the same dive boat as I did. A uh, beautiful girl. Um, and paintography works quite well on portraits like this, provided that you use it sparingly. It can really blur. But what I should do is make a duplicate image and then take the paintography off the eyes. The eyes should never be uh, twisted in. This was my other friend that worked on a dive boat. Imagine here I am as a captain of a dive boat. I have two crew working for me and they're both beautiful girls. I'm out there on a tropical island on the tropical Caribbean Sea and I have two beautiful girls working with me all my time. <laughs> You're a lucky life. man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great life. Okay, last two pictures. Give me two minutes to put through this. This is the original shot. And maybe on another show, the, the landscape photography might ask me back, and I will show you how to go from this picture to that picture in two clicks. Hmm. Two clicks in Adobe Photoshop. From that picture, the original, the green, to that picture. And I did that in two clicks. And that's the end of my little uh, presentation on photographs here. So maybe in a future date, uh, guys, if you want me to come back, I will happily show people how to get that uh, beautiful dawn light shot in two clicks in Adobe Photoshop from the original. I would like to know those two clicks. <laughs> that would be awesome, uh, Ray, the, to get the editing because you've stimulated the interest. Um, I'm sure we will all be looking at light and bugs and leaves and uh, grass a lot different and uh, appreciate the uh, detail with which you went through um, your shots because it really is that thinking part of stop, think, shoot. It's very important. T uh, S T S. Stop, think, shoot. Okay, well, you heard it here first on the Landscape Photography Show. So uh, we're coming to that um, period in our show where we share photographers that um, we believe you should watch and follow. So I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Jim Worthman. And uh, let's see if I can... What, my, my blue box isn't working here. Uh, <laughs> You're stuck with me. Let me see if I could go back to. I'm stuck on. Uh, oh gosh, well those gremlins, you know, they just come and go. Uh, for those who are watching, the person who starts the uh, the show uh, has control over who's showing on the screen with a blue box. I'm seeing and, Jim there. Oh, there. I was going to say, go, Jim. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks, Cara. And I guess before I start, I just want to thank thank Ray. That was amazing. I really enjoyed uh, not just seeing your work, but hearing about it. That was great. So let me share the screen. Um, my recommended photographer is Ryan Engstrom, and he's a graphic designer and landscape photographer. He's based in Minnesota. Um, and if you look at his stream, he has a wide variety of landscapes and uh, uh, from a variety of locations. You know, he has seascapes, uh, deserts, mountains, 
Um, he does both color and black and white. There are some wildlife shots. Um, and he's been selected multiple times in the landscape photography community for the landscape photo of the day. So um, definitely... Uh, an Australian photographer, and I believe he lives in a bus and kind of goes around surfing and fishing and, and taking photographs. So uh, that's got to be a, a wonderful uh, sort of existence uh, there, and he does beautiful work. Here you see some wonderful colors uh, and uh, excellent uh, reflections. And you can go to the next one. Uh, just lovely work. Uh, I, I love the soft waterfalls uh, that he produces. And this guy only has like 600 followers. So uh, if he's one that you don't know, and, and its probability is that you may not know him, I urge you to uh, circle him up and enjoy his fabulous photography. Wonderful Australian photographer. Thanks, Margaret. Okay, Kevin. Yeah, so this is Camille Donnelly, and uh, he is a very good photographer. Um, he's someone that I've I've always watched out for for a while. Since uh, every time I see a post from him, I know it's probably going to be a fairly good picture. So uh, go ahead and show the next one, um, just to give you an idea of the type of stuff he does. Um, he does a lot of seascapes and um, some long exposure stuff. And I'd encourage you to uh, circle him if you want to see some more of his great stuff. Okay, thank you. And Kara. Oh, I, I'm going to introduce you to Darren White, who is from the Denver, Colorado area. I met um, Darren on a recent uh, nightscape photography tour that we just went over Labor Day at Moab and this isn't one of his Moab pictures but um, this is indication of the type of work he does with the um, um, Milky Way. I think there's one more. Yes, and this is up at the Rocky Mountain National Park, one of Margaret's favorite places. Um, but again, he's got the light there from the, on the clouds and the movement in the water. And uh, this is Darren White from DarrenWhitePhotography.com in Denver, Colorado. Right, and uh, Ray, you're up. Hey, yes, this is a photograph by Chris McKay. Um, I have never met Chris in person, but I uh, introduced to his work a few weeks ago. They started to show up in my Magic of Light theme. And the reason I like them is they are reminiscent of the pictures that I like to take. Yeah. I'm not sure if this is a dawn or a sunset, um, but it's very much a picture I like to take. And I added this one into Grass Tuesday as well because you have the grass in there given the foreground, the middle ground, and then the trees on the uh, horizon way back there in the distance. Beautiful. The next one. And again, similar shot. And what's magic about this one is that beautiful wispy cloud that he's got sh uh, showed so yeah. prominently in there. Again, I think I'm going to give him the, the, the benefit of the doubt and say he got up early in the morning. This is a dawn <laughs> shot. Um, some people sneak sunsets into my dawn on Sunday, and, but I don't mind, you know, whether the sun's going up or going down. It doesn't really matter. Uh, it's the beauty of the picture. Look at the colors in here, and the, the magic of light is right across that whole image. Magnificent picture. Chris McKay has only got about uh, 900 followers. I don't think he's been on G Plus too long. So it's uh, C-H-R-I-S. You can see it on the screen there. M-A-C, capital K-A-Y, Chris McKay. Pop along to his uh, profile page and add him to your circles. Um, I don't think you'll be disappointed. Okay. Super. Okay, thank you. Kara, back to you. Okay, well, 
There we go. All right. Well, thank you. And we will create, um, we will have circles. And if you haven't been circling the landscape photography um, show page, uh, that's how you can add photos to any of the events that we're having. But we also create circles of the people who um, said, yes, they're coming to our show, or maybe they were. So uh, come on over and, and join our event. And also, we have a circle of all of the photographers to watch, which we post after each show in the show notes. So we'd like to invite you back to the 24th, September 24th. We'll be having a show on HDR, making it very simple. First, maybe some of you who don't understand it or know how to um, process that way. And then on October 8th, we have Jeff Sullivan back showing us how to edit night photography. So that's going to be fun. And Ray, thank you so much for coming, getting up so early. Now you'll go out and you'll get some fantastic shot because the uh, sun will be ready for you. And we would love to have you come back and show us how your editing skills um, take part in creating the wonderful um, photographs that you've shared with us tonight. So we'll be signing off and we'll see you all on the 24th for HDR. Good night and thank Bye, you. Everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night.